Welcome to Good Money Guide TV. In this episode, we're going to talk to Martin Sock of the new investment app, Lightyear. We're going to have a chat with him about why he founded the business, what he hopes to achieve, and where the app sits within the new investment platform landscape. Um, in particular, because there's been a big shift recently in new investors shying away from traditional investment platforms like Hargreaves Lansdowne, AJ Bell, an interactive investor, to the new breed of fintechy free investment apps. So Martin, thank you very much for, for coming to see us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So why don't you start off by telling us a, a little bit about Lightyear, it, in particular, why you founded it? So I founded that with my friend Mikkel. Uh, we both worked in TransferWise and we spent a lot of years trying to make sense of this weird investment financial world. Um, and it seems that in Europe, it doesn't really make sense in any of the countries, to be honest. Um, I think like the turning point was when uh, one of my friends asked Mikkel that where should I like where should I put my investments and how do I start investing and like you're in a position where you don't really have a good answer. Like it seems that there's a lot of players on the market, but when we start like digging into like what works, what doesn't work, what makes sense, what makes sense in the long run, where more kind of experienced people or novice people can start investing, then that was like we didn't have an answer for that, and that was the reason. Like we saw that. Every market in Europe is a little bit different, uh, but the whole is roughly the same shape. So it makes sense to kind of build this product for everybody in Europe. Okay, so the market didn't make sense. So then what, what did you do with Lightyear? What have you done with Lightyear to make the market make sense for people who want to start investing? So I think many ways people, um, or like the uh, kind of investment platforms are super local. In the same, same way, like banks are local. So if you think about like where people are investing today, they're effectively local market using local banks. Um, that's majority of investors in Europe. Means that they have often bad experience when investing in the US markets. Uh, they have bad experience when it comes to the FX. Um, but it's also like local markets are sometimes rather tiny. So it means that the kind of product quality and user experience is not up to the bar. So when we looked into what people are doing, especially when people are coming from, or like brokers coming from the US, then they build for a US market in mind or Germans build German market in mind um, and then realize that these products doesn't really work in them, maybe UK or Poland or Norway or whatever market we want to actually capture because people often have the wrong currency. They have their own local currency. They speak different language, they have different regulators, different instruments, and like all this stuff kind of comes up and then you realize like you need to build a product what's like global but local at the same time. And then the next step is like bringing the quality of the investments to the level that it makes sense to invest as kind of long period of time. So I think UK market is a, if you go to the bank, it's super expensive. Like every transaction costs money. There's a lot of hidden fees and whatnot. If you go to the maybe a new brokers, then lots of hidden fees. Sometimes you need to do like multiple conversions uh, to go to the US market and so on. So how do you kind of localize that experience? And I think it's normal that everybody has multiple different currencies, um, multiple different uh, markets to access, um, can use their own language and so on. It's definitely it's definitely the rise of the neo brokers. Oh yeah. I think I think local brokerage firms are. Are certainly on the way out. There was a good, um, uh, there, there was a good roundtable with Interactive Investor and Itoro, and they were saying, yes, it's definitely the rise of, of the neo brokers. It'll be those people that get to the top yeah. fastest. Uh, but it's still a long way to go there, yeah. because like I still like if you look into how many customers neo brokers have, then like they are not compared to the, like the bank customers still. So Europe hasn't done this transition from bank to the online brokers to the kind of uh, low cost brokers. So this transition hasn't happened. What happened in the US like 20 years ago, um, 10 years ago with the low cost uh, uh, players on the market. So we're just going there. It also shows that we have quite a bit fewer people who are actually investing uh, or understand what to do there. So I think there is a lot of education, a lot of product, a um, lot of connectiveness, what needs to be built in. Okay. And you mentioned earlier, the, the people investing locally and particularly European markets have a bad experience. Did you mean from a pricing point of view or from uh, a user experience point of view, it was a difficult thing to do? I think all of that. So let's start from the question that you have. Um, Europeans invest effectively like really similar in every single market. Uh, they invest 
in local market because they understand the local mar uh, market and then they invest US markets because US is a big prominent most popular market in the world. So French people do the same. They invest in the local market and French market and in the US market. So it means that you have to have access to at least both of them. Mm. So, but also you need to have access to the you know, ETFs on these markets, you need to have uh, kind of local currency around it. And then if you have all this infrastructure, what makes sense, then the next step is, does it make sense in the pricing point of view? And next step after that is that, do you understand how to use these products? And I think that's actually one of the big things that uh, like brokers have been kind of disregarding. They're just there's a form, fill out the form and go. And new brokers came in and said, like, I don't need to fill out the form, just click buy or sell and go. So, but like, you can move this experience quite a bit further in a way that you understand what are you buying and why are you buying and how your portfolio is doing. And you actually go into the real investment kind of understanding of that. Yeah, I think that's one of the, <coughs> the ways these fledgling investment apps have really succeeded actually by making the onboarding process so simple. I mean, it was only a few years ago still with some of the incumbent platforms that to open a SIP or, or an ISA, you had to fill in a, uh, you had to fill in a paper application form. Oh yeah. And it's, it's such a barrier. Um, I, I can do a, an interesting example here. We just recently launched business accounts and um, uh, business accounts, my, like when I opened the last one, it took me three weeks. My friend for them took like two months. The fastest we onboarded last week was 32 seconds. So you can really looking into what needs to be kind of validated, who are these people, how do, what kind of checks you need to do. If you're going to automate that, you can make it in a seamless. And like, this is actually like, I think a good showcase, like how people who are thinking of doing something, if you have a big barrier in front of you, then you often give up. So yeah. you have to have a lot of will to go through that. I think it makes sense to simplify that, all the experience, so you can get started. But now there's a question like how to educate people to make right decisions on top of that. Yeah, exactly. It's almost too easy to make a decision now yeah, but in some cases. Yeah, but I, I don't think that um, the bad user experience is a good educator. Mm -hmm. I think uh, good user experience actually helps to educate people as okay. well. Well, we'll get on to pricing and, and what markets you offer and how you offer it and your, you know, your educational services in a minute. But let's just talk about the business and, and getting it set up first. Was it? Obviously, you have a, a background from uh, TransferWise, Wise, the, um, the money transfer service. On the back of your experience at Wise, how difficult was it saying to investors, saying to technology providers, we're setting up a new investment app in a world where there's almost a new investment app released you know, ev every week? You know, how easy was it to get the business off the ground? And, and what did you say to investors that's going to make you guys different from all the other investment apps out there. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the kind of angle what we took, you know, like the reason why we built this is, is less of um, come in and start trading. It's more about like there's a massive market what nobody serves today in really well capacity and like that's a long-term investment market. Mm -hmm. To build really good product there, you need to have access to everywhere and like the trading capabilities and all that stuff has to be there. But I think the way like really practical way how to get people investing in a good way. I think that's like one of the kind of key elements what we are building here. Um, so we raised, uh, we had, so far we have raised 35 million uh, from various different investors, Lightspeed uh, partners, Mosaic, uh, Richard Branson, uh, TransferWays founder, David Hinrich, uh, Skype founder, Jan Dylan, and so on and so on. So effectively, when we sat down there like, all notorious investors. Um, yeah. They kind of saw the kind of the brokenness of the market. Um, and I think like the coolest thing what we saw during our fundraising was when, uh, for example, Lightspeed came to us and it wasn't that, oh, what do you do? But they were, we have this formula, like we have looked into this market and we see a massive hole here. We did analysis and like we saw that you guys are actually fixing that. So this was the place where we actually matched pretty well together because they looked from their side and they saw that nobody's really serving the good long-term investor market and we have been doing that for our, for our first couple of months already. Okay, wow. So 35 million and that gave you a valuation of, are you allowed to say what, what it gave you a valuation of? We haven't like uh, focused too much on evaluation. Like the main reason why we actually raised the money was um, we did raised the first uh, 1.5 million to make sure that we were able to build the first technology and go mm -hmm. to the market and then we went to the market in the UK roughly a year ago and uh, raised another 8.5 million. And now we went to the European market and raised another 25 million on top of that to go okay. to the European market. So we're like heavily on a product focused and making sure that we are able to build this massive machine what kind of serves every single market. Like the product, um, 
there's like so many different elements what needs to happen to actually have a really good local product market fit in every single yeah. market, then like this is our main focus today. Okay, that's really interesting. I mean, the reason I was asking about valuation is because there's been a very sort of specific trend that I think everybody's seen yeah. in that people are nowadays really only setting up companies to sell them. You know, there's, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you, you see it, you know, particularly with a lot of EC apps, there's um, a, a lot of investing apps, there's a sort of massive customer grab and they keep on coming back to the market and you sort of got to worry about burn rate and how much money are they spending and are they actually making any money? And, and the objective is rather to, to, to sell the business or, or to IPO it rather than provide investment facilities for customers over the next 30 years. Um, if you see my, so really, rather on that question, you know, where do you see the business going over the next? Will you be going back to the market um, for more money for um, for other regions? You know, are you profitable, or, or, or when? You know, when do you think? So, like, I think like the market conditions, and I think has changed quite considerably in recent uh, recent times, and like, I think it plays against like Vivas really well uh, because you you know, previously there was a lot of like market grab, try to get as many customers in, don't really matter who are these customers and whatnot. And we have been maybe more careful and trying to figure out like how to have the kind of sensible growth, sensible product, make sure that we get into this really, really good position. So we raised this money kind of with the focus that it takes years to get into the really good position. Like I don't think that investment apps are built overnight. It takes, there's a lot of nuances, a lot of different types of investors. You invest one way, I invest in a different way. So to have this good position, we wanted to have like a runway what helps us to get into a really, really good position. So we have no, re, no plans right now, come to the market to raise any more money. Um, like what's gonna happen uh, with the next round, I think depends heavily on uh, like how well we are able to get uh, all the kind of more local marketing and everything in a good position. So I do think that we need to crack markets and if markets are cracked well, then we can use money to accelerate our growth. If not, then it makes sense to build the product a little bit further. Okay. And let's just sort of talk about the, um, the almost elephant in the room when it comes to investment apps is, is, is how you're going to make money. Because yeah. there's two ways that investment platforms have traditionally made money. That's on uh, dealing commissions when you buy and yeah. sell stocks and account fees, whether that's a percentage or, or a flat fee for holding your, your shares in custody and, and, and looking after your investments. But you guys, you don't charge an account fee, you don't charge a dealing commission. So I think like the way how investment platforms make money is actually a little bit wider. So if you take um, whatever big brokerage, then half of the money comes from interest. So they have cash lying on the ground, uh, they are lending money out, whatnot. There's a lot of elements what kind of produce interest uh, income. There is a hidden FX, like most of the banks in the world are like making their FX transactions and they're rather expensive in a way. Then you have transaction fees, account fees, and like the list actually goes on for sure, a long, sure. long time in various different spreads and so on. So your objective is to make money in the background rather than from the rather directly from the customers. So our, so our focus is we selected FX first because A, this is something what we understand how FX works and uh, uh, B, uh, everybody in Europe has a wrong currency. Yeah. Like if half of the flows go to the US means that whatever country you are in Europe, you have to convert to the dollars. Yeah. Um, if you want to invest from France to UK or whatnot, you need to go to the pounds and whatnot. So there's a lot of FX what's happening on the market. So it makes sense to yeah. charge that. Particularly as the US market is a lot stronger than the English one. Exactly. And also the dollar is a lot stronger than the sterling at the moment. So you're actually, it's actually a bit of a double whammy. Isn't so it? that makes a lot of sense. Um, interest makes a lot of sense, but like this is more of the kind of scale like revenue stream. Um, we are launching also uh, kind of the premium type product and the premium type product focuses on uh, um, like how do you have more experienced people to have more kind of kind of good benefits for them when they're doing like uh, more active investing or whatnot. Um, so effectively we like our main focus is to figure out how to charge as low as possible but like we want to be honest towards us and our customers to make sure that all this kind of revenue structure makes sense. So whatever we do, we try to be like upfront, as simple as possible, clear that these are the fees what we're taking and that's it. Okay. So, and, and also actually we were chatting earlier just beforehand about how investing is, is, is actually quite, quite a boring thing. And the, and, <laughs> and, and, the, and the real strategy is just to buy something and, and, and do nothing. But when I was playing about with your app, I did see um, a, 
a few cool features which which a few others don't have particularly um, limit orders where you can set your own price and sort of automatic regular automatic regular investing so and you were talking as well about you know slightly larger customers so can we just talk about your cl your client profiles at the moment you know how, you know, how many customers do you have on board? What sort of assets have you got on account? And do you find that a lot of your customers, you know, use limit orders or do they just go into the market and buy something? And, and do they do the sensible thing and set recurring orders for, you know, to, to drip feed their money into the market? Yeah. So I think this is actually interesting. We have been like focusing a lot on trying to profile in a way that the, our ambition and also like what's our customer profile. I think the real answer is that we have everybody on the platform, but like the majority of the customers, you could call them conscientious investors, like who are thinking a little bit long-term is bigger AUMs, uh, assets under management, um, maybe a little bit less active. Uh, and the second one is like um, uh, curious explorers where who are more curious, like how the companies are doing more kind of individual investing and so on. So I think these two types are like our main focus today. And like why this is main focus is these customers are often underserved. Yeah. So they uh, usually use the bank. Um, they their kind of uh, investment profiles actually work really well with our values, but uh, like it's they don't look for like gamified apps, whatnot. They want to have like a little bit more serious platform to actually make their investment decisions. So this is the kind of the target what we are aiming for and like uh, building product towards these customers' needs. And this is something what we see actually uh, quite often when people are coming back to us. It's like, oh, this makes sense in these, these, these ways. And they are also giving us a lot of feedback, like how to improve the product, what kind of new features come in and whatnot, so we can offload their kind of investment portfolios to the current bank to us. Okay, that's great. And how many customers do you have? So we're rather small. So we're yeah. just uh, started like a year ago. And so we have been growing like 20% roughly every month in a way. So we're going actually in a really nice trajectory, but we're just launching in the European markets. European growth is just picking up, so uh, okay. getting there. Okay, and, and, and let's just talk about ed education. So ed educating educating customers it's one of, you know it's one of the hardest things to do we were we were chatting and and there's obviously a big difference between a trading account which is obviously short term speculation investing which is you know which is which is long term growth and the key to sort of people investing successfully is doing it as early as possible and and obviously the the younger you are it's easier to understand if it's if it's gamified for example, I was talking to um, uh, one of the founders of 7IM and he was telling me that um, their app for children was developed by the people who originally built Donkey Kong. Okay. So, you know, they, they, they made it a game to engage with younger investors. But the FCA has recently come out and said, listen, the, gaming, the gamification of investing is, is not on. It's a serious thing. Um, so do you, do you find it difficult to have a balance between the seriousness of education, which nobody will read because it's boring, and making it interesting and making it a game, and then perhaps trivialising it? So that's a big question. I would separate multiple things here. Yeah. I think I would separate gamification from education, actually. Um, you have um, gamification tries to get people like endorse some some sort of the goal to make some action in a way um, education don't have to be like that education can be also like creating cl clarity of understanding so uh, having a really good understanding where uh, what's actually happening in the market what other people are doing how uh, your portfolio is actually performing how much you pay for that like all these kind of elements and then you have this kind of basics of uh, like diversification, dollar cost averaging and all that stuff, which comes, I would say, in the kind of clarity point of view. And education also is not uh, only for people who have no idea how investing works. So I think education has lots of layers. So if you have uh, maybe more experienced person, then they want to have a better understanding of their portfolio moving and also understand what's happening in the market and get information out of that and maybe look into more advanced stuff. Um, then you have a um, similar thing for maybe invest, uh, dividend investors and so on. And then you have like a pocket of customers who effectively need to be convinced that they should be investing. 
So in that sense, I think like education is like a broader topic and a lot of the, I think education today is still understanding that um, how to take a long-term view, understand what's happening in your portfolio, that you're making right decisions and you're not gambling effectively. So I think a lot of work needs to be happening there. Um, nobody's really good at it still. We're getting there. Um, uh, gamification, I think, has been kind of going overboard in the last couple of years. Um, effectively going, coming into the place where don't think about money, just go in and do yeah. stuff. And I, I, I don't think it's actually the right way. Like this is the good way to lose lots of your money really quickly. So in that sense, I don't think that, like I do think FCA is in the right place. FCA sees to, how to protect these customers. Um, I think today, a uh, lot of these customers who went in the last couple of years actually lost already money. Mm -hmm. And now the market is a little bit scary for them because like, how do you go from there after you lost some money? So now you, people start to think about it like, so what do you need to do? Mm -hmm. And now there's, I think the actual education comes in. So in that sense, they, they got a little bit like hit and now they are trying to make like actual education the next steps. Okay. And um, just talking actually about education, obviously the simplest thing to uh, you know educate is is is, is long term investing. But <clears throat> if you don't mind, we just touch on derivatives products for a minute. There's always the temptation to sort of move into uh, move into that region. And you know I've been in derivatives for for twenty years. You know it's not an evil product, but it some kind sometimes can be given to the wrong people. It's actually a very useful product for protecting your portfolio. Um, you know, by taking on short positions or, or buying options to, you know, to, to hedge your stocks. Do you have any intentions of bringing a slightly more derivative products onto the platforms or will you, will you be sticking with, with investing? Not today. Um, like the main reason for that is we effectively have mapped out like what's the problem here. And like our problem today is that I think public market investing doesn't really make sense. If you look into uh, like the assets what are on that market, how many people are investing there, uh, how many potential is there, and uh, what's actually going on. Then it's a rather sad state, I think. There's a lot of people are underserved and whatnot. Derivatives type products are like more professional investors. Um, there's a lot of, like not a lot, but there's already products on that market. Mm -hmm. There's also um, various different kind of crypto type products and whatnot, like more risky type kind of profile. What's your view on crypto? Like I see like people are investing in crypto and people are asking us crypto, but like crypto is quite a bit smaller than public markets. So again, like we are prioritizing uh, on, a, on a way how we are able to offer pro uh, like the biggest bang for a buck. Uh, but also I think when we're going into more risky products, then we need to realize that how do we help people to understand to how they're making great decisions. Yeah. And uh, I think like public markets in many ways are the good first step in a way. And then if you're graduating from there, then you can have like more interesting products in a, or like more complicated products yeah. in a way. But maybe that's not the first step. Okay. And um, your best and worst experiences of running the business, you, you found it launched a, a year and a half ago? Roughly, yeah. Um, what's, been, what's been the best part of running the business so far? I'm going to ask you about the worst part in a <laughs> as well. So, I think the best part is um, we have moved incredibly quickly. Yeah. So we managed to get in the first year in 20 different markets in Europe, um, and like the customer feedback has been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, like. I think like the happiest days in my life is that when customers just come back and say like like this makes sense. Uh, I would love to have these more features and like this this is really needed in the market and I, I get value out of it. So yeah. that's by far the best. And as we're like iterating rather rather quickly, then uh, we get that quite a lot. Okay. Um, and the worst? What's what's been not well, the worst? The most challenging thing? What's what's been most difficult? So we launched. At the end of Brexit, so we lost, uh, not lost, but like we needed to do multiple different licenses to operate. Mm -hmm. Then um, COVID happened, so we didn't see a people. Uh, then uh, uh, inflation uh, happened. COVID is a double-edged sword, though, because yeah. we didn't see anyone, but everybody started investing and trading. Through that. Oh. Yeah. A lot of these things are happening. War in Europe, inflation. Yeah. So um, it has been like constantly, you need to figure out how your business makes sense in this world. I think the good thing for us is that we don't really kind of, we don't look into short term view. We know that you have an amazing product, it takes years to get there. So in that sense, uh, various different fluctuations in the market and whatnot doesn't 
really affect us. Uh, mm -hmm. There's like um, maybe in the quarterly re results, you're like more critical of like, oh, this quarter is going one way or another. But in the long term, if we have the same speed, we are going in the same trajectory, then it actually like irons out quite well. But yeah, it's not like it's not easy to build an investment product. <laughs> it's not. Um, so two, fi two, fin two final questions then. You've obviously seen a lot of investors over the last year and a half on your <coughs> on your app. Um, what would you say is the biggest mistake they make when they're beginning their investment journey, and and what can they do to you know become better investors? Do you think? So, again, I think there's so many different investors out there. Um, different profiles have different mistakes, but to kind of, I think like if you kind of unify everything and like take one thing, then uh, people think too short termist. Yeah. They go in, they look their uh, stock price every single day. And I don't think that actually, like in, in general, this doesn't really help. Uh, okay. I think the longer term view you have, like the, you're setting your success up a little bit better. So that's what I see, not only um, like in general in the market is that there's an excitement to go in, you want to be part of it, but like weirdly you should put money in, have a regular view, have kind of risks mitigated, and then let go a bit. Okay. And, uh, and final question, uh, you know, we talked about education and getting started and all that sort of thing. And one of the things we always ask is, is do you have a favorite book on investing? If anybody's got the time to sit down and read a book um, or, or a website or service that, that, that you could recommend that you think will help people understand investing or managing their money better, what, what would you recommend? I would answer this in a way that the best way to do it would be um, have two sources, uh, like have a book to get uh, good understanding how what is investing, how investing works and whatnot, and then find your, yourself um, somebody who is um, a little bit more active, explaining you what's going on in the investment world, shares maybe the current world climate and whatnot, and um, be critical of that person being like, uh, have them like as a voice of reason in a way. Yeah. So why I'm saying that is book could be a good um, theoretical place to read and get the understanding. But if you have somebody um, uh, who's more opinionated, understands the world, then they keep you going. Yeah. Because that information keeps you more excited and then you learn constantly more. Because I don't think like just reading a book, you will get super smart always. But if you don't understand the fundamentals, exactly. you can't understand what people are telling you. So I think like one book you can get started is like um, Andrew Craig's How to Own the World. It's a good way to simplify how the investment world works, what should you think of, like how do you think global and all that stuff. And then whatever market you are, find this one person who's like a voice of reason. There's usually this rather practical, uh, not clickbaity people who um, take it investing maybe a little bit more seriously. Um, that's usually the good way to kind of understand a little bit more details, like what's happening later on. Okay. Well, Martin, I mean, you know, good, good advice, good chat. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, if you'd like to know what we think of um, Lightyear, we've tested the app. Our review will be on the website um, shortly. And also we'd like to know what you think about Lightyear as well. So if you've used it, come to the Good Money Guide, fill in our survey and let us know what you think of Lightyear compared to the other investment apps you've used. And that will go into the, uh, the data we collect for our annual awards. So thank you very much for watching.